The title of today's message is Advancing Through Adversity. I knew the passage that I wanted to preach last week. I knew the word advance needed to be there because it's right there in the very first verse that we'll cover. But I'm thinking advancing through and I just looked over the passage again and the only word that came to me was adversity and it did not feel good all week long. I thought, God, I got to preach on adversity, affliction, oppression persecution, tribulation, trouble. It's not a feel-good message, but it's a message that is very important for us because we need to encourage one another in the race that we're running. Would you open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1? The letter to the Philippians, some of your study notes will say it was written while Paul was in chains in Rome. There are some theories that it was written while Paul was two years imprisoned in Caesarea. And someone else had an idea that was written from Ephesus. I am choosing to believe it was written from Caesarea because I want to think about this two-year period where we are in our study in the book of Acts. Felix, the governor, had told the centurion to give Paul liberties, give him freedom, and allow his friends to come and meet his needs. So I think there was quite a bit of freedom for Paul to do what it is he felt needful to do. And if you were the Apostle Paul, what would you think would be important? If you had to stay someplace month after month, you don't know how long it's going to be. It winds up being two years, but you've got some freedom. You can't leave, but you have some freedom. And friends can bring you what you need. Probably you're going to write more letters. So Philippians are among those epistles that we call prison epistles because he speaks of being in chains. Philippians 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Advancing. How many of you would like to advance, would like to progress? 15-year-olds want to be 16 because maybe they can advance and get their driver's license and advance to become a driver. Some want to advance to become a legal adult. They can marry. They can uh, buy property and sell property, and they have all the rights and the privileges and responsibilities. They get to pay taxes. I want to advance to become a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. Some people want to advance in their job to just get up a notch, a higher pay grade. But for Paul, he wants you to know that what has happened to him has actually served to advance the gospel. Remember, Paul did not write this in his own mission statement. I'm going to be imprisoned for two years. I will not have the freedom to come and go on more missionary trips. Maybe he would have wanted to get on with that fourth missionary journey to Spain. Remember, he had written already to the Romans, saying, I want to go to Spain, and I want to stop in Rome and visit with you folks there, and have you help me get onward to Spain. So Caesarea is not Paul's plan. And if he wrote it here during these two years from Caesarea, he would want us to know that what happened to him has actually served to advance the gospel. Might you be more effective stuck in one place, focusing, even in the midst of limitations, might you be more effective Submitting to the circumstances in your life under the Lordship of Christ, might you be more effective for the sake of the gospel? If you open the hymnal and look through the stories of the hymns, many of them were written in the midst of affliction while people were on sick beds. 
Paul says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Was he literally chained up? I don't think so. Because Felix said, give him some liberties, give him some freedoms. It's like a trustee in the jail. He gets to come and go, gets to have some freedoms that other prisoners don't have. House arrest. But he's saying, I am in chains. The same word is used when he's chained up in the Philippian jail. And there was an earthquake and those bonds fell off. So the word is physical chains, but it can also represent a different kind of binding. Mark chapter 7, verse 32. Some people brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Tom Ronk, would you get your Bible open to Mark chapter 7, 32? I've got a little Bible here, and I opened up and looked at it, and the print is kind of small. And I remember a day when I could read print like that, but it's hard for me now. I take my glasses off, I put them back on, trying to figure out which one's better. Tom, come on up here, please. I went to Michigan and visited my mentor, Reverend Elder Ezel Player. He's now 84 years old, and he can't preach anymore. But he taught me this style of preaching. I say he was my mentor. He never took me under his wing and said, I'm going to mentor you. What he did was he preached the gospel, and he had certain expectations upon the young men. He'd say, I believe in the word it says somewhere that some people brought to Jesus a man who was deaf. As soon as he would say, I believe in the word it says somewhere, that was our cue to start looking in our concordance and try to figure out what he's talking about. And as soon as someone would find the passage, they would stand and he'd say, read. There are some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Well, hold on a second. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Daniel, you come on up here. You got nice ears. Now, I've seen this on television. Okay, Jesus did this. Read. put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Ugh. <laughs> he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. Be at, opened. at this, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosened. His and tongue, Hold on. His tongue was... Oh. His tongue was loosened. Read. And he began to speak plainly. His tongue was loosened from the chains that had held it. His tongue had been stiffened. It had been tightened. He couldn't speak. He was deaf, but he could hardly talk. But when Jesus opened his ears and loosened his tongue, the chains fell off his tongue. Thanks, Daniel. Now, we believe in healing here at Bell Road Baptist Church, but I just, unless the Lord told me to stick your fingers in the lady's ear, spit on the ground, touch her tongue, that's probably not going to be happening. But it is biblical. I've seen it on television. And um, it's in the Bible. But there's something that I know very clearly we're supposed to do. If there's somebody who's sick among us, the Word of God tells us, New Testament saints, that you should call upon the elders of your church and let them pray for you. Call upon the elders of your church. We have elders here, don't we? So if there's any sick among us, call upon the elders of the church and let them pray for you the prayer of faith. It's a righteous prayer. It's a prayer in right standing with God so that his will can be done in your life so that healing may come. And James went on in chapter 5 to say, and if you've sinned, your sins will be forgiven. 
Because when you're calling upon God through his people, you're binding yourself in your hearts with them. That we're getting real here. We are to confess our sins to one another and pray for each other so that we may be healed. See, unconfessed sin is a sickness. Unconfessed sin is, a, is an oppression. It's something that Jesus does not want for us. And so one of his ministries in the church is to pray for each other that we might be healed. In special ministries class today, the, the lesson asked, if you told a lie, what could you do to make it right? And I offered the suggestion, tell another lie to cover it up. And one of the students in special ministries class said, no, tell the truth. Another said, go and tell the person you're sorry that you lied to them and tell the truth. And so we talked about that the father of the lie is the devil. And so we all admitted we've told lies. And so some in the class admitted different times they told lies. And I'm not going to name her name, but she's going to play organ tonight. She said she stuck her finger in the cake. And her mother said, who stuck your finger in the cake? And she said, I didn't. And she let her brother take the blame. But she felt so guilty that later she said, Mother, I'm the culprit. I'm the guilty one. She made it right. I'm so happy to be in a church where we confess our faults to one another, our sins to one another, and we can pray for each other. I asked the question, can a pastor tell a lie? And some said, yes. And, Not you. I said, let's clarify. Can I tell a lie? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a liar because the devil is the father of the lie. So I need to belong to a church where if I do lie, I can confess. I said something that was wrong. I've been feeling guilty about it. I confess. And that you'd pray for me. Because we all fall short of the glory of God. This is the kind of church where we're going to experience the healing that God has for his people his way. So this is a, a chain, a bond on a tongue that has been keeping that tongue from talking. And it was tied somehow to the man's hearing. He was deaf and mute, basically. And Jesus set him free, healed his hearing, and loosened the chains on his tongue. Luke 13. Find it, young man. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Um, Sarissa, can you come up and play the part of a woman? Come on. Let's... This is the girl who ran through the marathon. We talked about her last week. She got up to 26 miles. and <laughs> 26 miles, 26 miles. And she's wondering where the fanfare is, where's the crowd, where's the finish line. And someone says, it's 26.2 miles. That was Sarissa. She trained well, but you forgot the point too. Okay, I want you to advance in age about what you're 20. How old are you? 22. Okay, it's already happening, folks. Let's add about, let's add 70 years to you. And I want you to walk from here to here about age 92. Just hunch over a little bit. Osteoporosis starting to set in. Get, get your walker in front of you. That might help. Okay. okay. There, you there you go. 92 years old. Well, hello, Miss Sarissa. So glad to have you in church today. Okay. Stay right there, all right? She was bent over. Bend over farther, all right? There. Okay. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Read. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. 
then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. And praised God. Okay. Okay. Thank you. If you look at the Greek, this binding was not just typical old age. This was a crippling by a spirit. And that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the same word, pneuma, spirit. But it's by a spirit of affliction, a spirit of adversity, a spirit of oppression. You know, the idea of oppression is something squeezing down on you. And it's not usually a good thing. It's something pushing down on you. And so this lady, for 18 years, had had something evil oppressing her, pushing her down. Now, I think this could even happen if you were suffering from depression. Instead of looking up and praising God as a normal thing, you're looking down, you're hunching over, you don't have much posture, much self-confidence. You're being pushed down. It might be something within, anger turned inside, but it might be some power, principality of darkness, something that does not want you to raise your hands and glorify God, pushing you down. Jesus said, come here. Read. Verse 12. 